All right, Jamie, we are live. Excellent, excellent. Kind of hearing the winds howl outside, so I'm hoping we're gonna make it all the way through this. Uh, <laughs> in the Northeast, there's some, some pretty heavy winds blowing out there, so we've seen the power blink a couple times, so don't worry if we, if we lose power in this, we can come back. I've got it all written down someplace, so we can come back to get it. Um, so welcome to uh, Transfer Function Part 2, our Session 7 of the SOFO Sessions, uh, calling this Making Measurements, Magnitude and Coherence. Um, please keep in mind this is this covering the the transfer function measurements. It's going to take four sessions to cover. Phase is going to be next session on the one we're going to do this coming Wednesday. In this one, this is just a continuance of what we did uh, on the last. Uh, Wednesday when we recorded it um, but basically now we're going to actually look at active measurements and we're just going to pay attention to magnitude and coherence for today and keep in mind what we're focused on here is we're focused on basically the the mechanics of the measurement we're not we're not really going to focus too much on using the data to make decisions yet and reading the data um, in general. We're just focused on the mechanics of the transfer function measurement. So in this session, um, one of the first things we'll do is we'll do a really quick review of what we talked about before. Um, then we're gonna start off with some near field measurements. For those of you, again, who have been in my session, my, my, uh, my uh, Smart Operator Fundamentals class, you'll have been through this whole progression. So we're gonna start with near field measurements. We're going to talk about the live IR and the transfer function measurements and setting the delay and and we're going to talk about you know how I said that that we're assuming our systems are linear. Um, we're going to do a thing smart is dumb. Now here's the thing about the transfer function measurement is it doesn't necessarily correspond with your hearing mechanism. So I, I'm going to make that that uh, point uh, with a couple of quick demonstrations and then also we'll we'll do a measurement with music we're not just going to use pink noise going through the system but we're going to use we'll use music to to measure the response of our system here um, and then um, we're going to start moving the microphone around we're going to get out of the near field we're going to bring in an assistant to move the microphone around um, and so once we do that, uh, we're going to move back. We're going to talk about uh, setting the delay, the tracker, um, upping the averaging, talk about some of this stuff, the, the techniques. In the near field, the near field measurement is a, is a great measurement for, it really follows along what an anechoic measurement would, would show you. And I'll, I'll give you a, a quick demonstration of that, show you some data that kind of points that out. But um, what we're going to do is we're going to move back and we're going to start to experience some of the room and we'll talk about measuring our delay when we do that um, and then we'll talk about averaging both temporal and spatial in um, averaging is a technique we use with data to basically reject what's varying and and look at what's consistent so in averaging the data you're going to stabilize the data noise the reason for temporal averaging or averaging over time is that as you average more and more data together, what you're gonna do is reject the variance in your measurement, which is the noise and, and late arriving reverberance and things like that. Um, and so uh, then we're also gonna look at spatial averaging. So we'll move the microphone around. And again, we're asking a basic question. I'm assuming this speaker has a response. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna measure at a few different places. And the reason why we're looking at a few different places is What's showing up at any one microphone position when I take a measurement is going to be the response of that, that speaker in, the, in that environment plus the room and noise. And so that's going to vary. The, the effects of the room are going to vary as I move the microphone around. And so what I'm trying to do by doing a spatial average, either I'll do it just by looking at the traces and just eyeball average them, or we can actually average the data, the traces together. Um, but basically, I'm just trying to see what's consistent between those measurement points. The basic concept is I'm probably going to employ an equalizer. I've got to, I've got to do a tuning on the speaker. Now, um, an equalizer is a tool that is your least effective tool. It's, it's, unfortunately, it's used to go after things that it has no business being applied to. But the one thing we are going to look for is when it comes time to using that tool, 
um, we really want to apply it to the things that are consistent in the listening area. That's the only thing that the EQ is going to be even remotely useful for. Um, and so we're going to look for what's consistent. If, if we've got a peak in the system or a peak showing up at one microphone position that's not in another, I can't really set an EQ for one point to another. So that's what we're going to be looking for. Um, and then lastly, we'll talk about some multi-transfer uh, function demos. I just want to um, smart, we're going to start off, everything we're doing is just with one transfer function measurement. But um, at the very end, we'll get into multiple simultaneous measurements. We're going to do multi-mic measurement, and we're also going to do a thing called room EQ resultant. We we'll just look at complementary EQ, and and it's just a good demonstration of using Smart this this beast that is Smart, and why I would run multiple simultaneous transfer function measurements. Okay, so again, I'm Jamie Anderson, um, uh, the director of training and president here. Um, the people involved in this presentation again are Chris Tenjoris, who is our product manager, who is probably on online right now doing support, Michael who's riding shotgun in in this, um, and Gavin Kanan who is our training coordinator and he is also online. Um, and again of course ra Rational Acoustics, um, and if that's that uh, email address support at rationalacoustics.com you want an address to ask questions to support at rationalacoustics.com that's the one you want to go to. Okay so we'll go back to just the basic idea, this is, this is in the background here, we've got, we take a signal, we send it into the system, we get the signal out of the system, right? We can look at that individual signal, we can look at the spectrum of the signal and the output, or on the input, and then what we're going to do is compare what we sent into the system to what we got out of the system to see what the system is doing to the signal passing through it. Okay, so when I start my transfer function measurement running, this is the basic what's going on in the background is that it's going to grab a chunk of the wave going into the system that we call that input signal we call that the reference signal um, and then we're going to grab a chunk of the signal coming out we call that the measurement signal so we're going to then take those those chunks we're going to run an FFT on them and get the complex spectra of the of those two signals then we're going to run a transfer function or see how they differ um, and then we'll run another IFT to go back to time domain to see the response of the system in time domain. So what we've got is what we've got here is we've got single channel uh, frequency domain. We've then we run a, a transfer function. We get single channel. Uh, oh, sorry, we started single channel time domain. Bunch of you probably caught that. Uh, single channel time domain. Or that's the waveform. We run an FFT. It shows us the single channel, the spectra of the signal. So that's frequency domain. We do the transfer function to get the frequency response. So it's the response of the system in magnitude and phase by frequency. The x-axis here is is the uh, the um, the x-axis is frequency down here. Um, we run an IFT and we get the time domain view of the system response. What's kind of interesting here is again this is literally, and this is a proper use of the word liter literally, but this data and that data are the exact same data. We're just looking at it a different way. So here in frequency domain, we see a comb filter. And if you actually had the data pulled up, you'd see the, a peak at 2K, 4K, 6K, 8K. So that's a two kilohertz comb. If you look at that same data in time domain, you see a, an arrival and then another arrival a half millisecond later. So the comb filter frequency is 2K which comes from arrival at 1 over 2k which is half millisecond. Anyway, um, so that's what's going on in the background and remember when you hit run on your measurement engine um, it starts doing this, it does this 24 times a second. So every 24th of a second it runs this complete measurement. Okay, and remember the, just another critical thing is that for our measurement because the measurement signal is coming out of the system um, later than you grab the reference signal what, one of the things we need to do, the first step when we're doing a, a transfer function, is to find that latency through the system and then set the delay on the reference signal and the measurement so that we've got the best correlation between my reference signal and the measurement signal. Okay, and then again, one more time, we're talking about what, we, what our basic measurement that we've set up here for, we're going to grab as our reference signal, we're going to grab the output of the mixer 
and we're going to compare it to a microphone sitting in front of the speaker. Right now the microphone is positioned about one meter in front of the speaker. Um, and so um, the, the thing is that, that what you want to be aware of is what is between your reference and your measurement. So the transfer function is going to say from that when we grab that signal till it came out at the microphone, we want to know what that part of the system um, is doing to our signal as it passes through it. Remember what's upstream of your measurement is just part of the reference signal. Whatever comes out of that mixer, we don't care. It's just whatever that shows up at that reference signal point, we want to look at how well it was transmitted downstream. So it's always important to know what's between point A and point B in, in your transfer function here. Okay, so this is the measurement that we set up um, that we set up last week at the end of the class. And so we'll jump over here. So I'm, very quickly I come in, I make sure that all my signals are showing up here. I'm gonna jump over to my TF tab. So in my TF tab, I set up a transfer function. If I double click on the measurement engine, it will take me the details about that, the, about that measurement engine. And so we can see the details of this. We can see that it's measurement signal is mic one and its reference signal is the mix out and this is the settings for that basic measurement engine so what i'm going to do is i'm going to give myself um, some noise so i've got noise going here so i'm going to go ahead and unmute the signal at the the speaker now keep in mind as we go through this i'm going to try and speak loudly but i will be talking at the same time i'm making noise in the over across the room from me so please bear with me that that noise is kind of might annoy you a bit but here we go so I go ahead and I I'm going to take my measurement and I will start with no delay I'll turn on my measurement okay so very quickly hold on one more time I'll give you some noise again <laughs> I'm going to pause this measurement and show it to you. So um, I'm going to make reference to the fact that the live IR was blowing up um, just a second ago. But what I'm doing right now is I'm, I've got a microphone that's sitting a meter away from the speaker straight on axis. Um, so my first question when I'm taking my measurement is, am I doing my measurement right? It's not what decisions I want to make on the data. It's first, do I have good data? Have I, and one of the critical questions to ask right now is, have I set my delay? Now, on the screen right now, there are four places that are telling me, no, you haven't. Um, the first one is the live IR, the time domain view right here. You can see that if there is the arrival, the impulse arrival, and it's certainly not at time zero, the center of this live IR screen is going to be whatever our reference delay is set to. So right now, that's what we're timed to in our measurement. Of course, the arrival of the output of the system is not, we're not set to that. If my delay was set properly for my measurement, this impulse would be dead center. Um, the second place that's telling me I didn't set my delay properly is the coherence. We talked about this uh, in the last session that the coherence, particularly up in the high end where the time constants um, are, are particularly short, um, you can see that the coherence seems pretty pissed off. You can see this little control uh, on the right side, side of the, the magnitude trace, that's called coherence blanking, and what it does is it hides data on the screen that's below a certain coherence. So it's, it's just a way of cleaning up the screen from uh, data that may be bogus. It doesn't get rid of the data. It just it just hides it. It doesn't clutter the screen with it. But this is a really good indication that I haven't set my delay properly. Um, up above this, this is the phase response trace, and it seems to be pissed off about something. It doesn't it doesn't look nice. And phase is about timing, and so even though we can't read the phase response yet, that'll be next week. Um, it's saying our delay isn't set properly. And then, of course, one other indicator over here is, of course, that right over here, the, uh, the delay is set to zero. So obviously, we haven't set our delay. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start my measurement running again, and I'll give myself some noise. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here in my measurement engine. There's a button that says find. And so when I hit find, Smart is going to go and and run a a transfer function measurement. Basically, go to the impulse response, find the peak of the impulse response, which is going to be the arrival of the direct sound, and it's going to tell me what that time is. So I'll go ahead and I'll run the finder. Okay, so it came back with a number that says 9.17 milliseconds or 3.15 meters. Now, what's up here? I placed my microphone one meter out in front of the speaker. I actually measured it with a, with a meter stick, and yet it's saying uh, 3.15 uh, meters. Where's that number come from? Well, what Smart does is Smart has a setting for what the speed of sound. The speed of sound is basically the speed of sound in air. It's just taking the speed of sound in air and multiplying it by the delay time. What we're actually measuring is this. We're actually measuring a time through the system, a latency through the system. Um, now, why is it not one meter? Well, if we go and we take a look at our, our drawing of our system, we'll notice that this is time zero and it actually passes through some DSP and some other processing in the speaker in the amp as well as processing uh, traveling through air. So e yes, there's 9.16 milliseconds or thereabouts of, of delay through the system. Only a portion of that is due to the transmission through the air. Some of that is due to the electronics that the, the signal is passing through. Okay, so we'll go on back and look at this. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to go ahead and insert that delay time in my measurements. So now you can see 9.17. And when we look up at the live IR, as soon as I start taking the measurement, you're going to see the center of the live IR is going to be set to 9.17. So here we go to our measurement again. All right, so don't be pissed off that this the live IR is blowing up when I turn off the noise. What's happening is the, the live IR measurement is set to a very short time constant. It's set to be really, really quick because we want to see if that timing is changing. It's set to be really responsive. And so my turning off the noise tends to piss off the measurement. Um, so don't worry about it. As long as it's nice and solid, well, I've got not, oh, see, that's great. I turned it off and I, the data stayed. Um, but as long as it's got good data while I've got noise going through it, I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, okay, so uh, what we've got here, my question again comes in, did we set our delay? And here my answer is, well, yes. I can tell because up in the, the live IR, the impulse is dead center. The phase trace is not so chaotic. Um, in the magnitude trace, the coherence is perfectly happy as a clam here and the delay time seems to be in the right ballpark. Um, if the, This is your chance though to check. You are there to check your measurement. So if, I, if I'm taking my measurement and I find a delay time that my, my microphone is, I don't know, like you know three feet, a meter in front of the speaker, but my delay time comes back 300 milliseconds, stop, right? And figure out what happened. Right, it may the delay through the system might be 300. There might be some DSP that has 300 milliseconds of delay, or if I happen to be using multiple microphones, maybe I'm on the wrong microphone. So um, you should always be doing sort of an idiot check on your measurements and looking, say, am I screwing this up? Um, and in this case, I'm saying, well, okay, that's that makes sense. It's it's a meter's worth of travel in air plus some latency through the electronics. So this all looks copacetic to me. So before we dig any further into this, what I want to do is I want to, I want to show you a couple things about just the basic mechanics of this measurement. Um, the, the first thing we'll talk about is um, we'll talk about uh, just linear time invariant systems. So basically, does the response to this system change with drive level? So I'll just do a very simple demonstration of that. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the noise back on and you should be able to hear this happening in the background. But
right? And so the measurement itself, even though you could hear the system go up and down in level, nothing changed on the screen. That's because it's a linear system. Its response isn't changing with level going through it. If we look at where we were measuring, where we were making the change in the system, and what we could hear is we were moving up and down the level of the signal going through the system. So we were turning it up on the console. Little side note here. Um, I, would, I would really suggest that if you guys are playing the home game, in fact, you guys are all at home, um, uh, it would be, you know, it would be a good idea to set up a little system like it. it doesn't take a lot of equipment. Um, and go ahead, you don't need to measure along right now, but, but go back and reproduce these measurements. It's a, it's a good chance to do some at-home learning. This is what we do when we do the live classes as well. So in that case, I was changing the gain here. Now, what happens, let's say, if instead we're not changing, we're going to change the gain in the system, but we're going to actually do it in the system itself. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to turn on the noise again. And so now I'm turning down the gain of the system, turning it back up. Turn it down, turn it back up. All right, so what I'm gonna do here is just for a point of reference, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna capture this data. I capture the data, the hotkey for capturing data is the space bar. Um, I could also hit this button down here, which is probably the lonely, loneliest button in our, on our interface because nobody uses that button. Everybody uses the space bar. Um, also, this capture button right here is another way to capture the data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the noise. I'm going to hit capture. I'm going to name my data near field. So here we go. So I just captured that data and I can bring that data to the front right here. And you can see that when we captured the data, what we captured was the magnitude phase, the coherence and the live IR. So all of those things were captured at that time. Now keep in mind, while we can show multiple magnitude traces and multiple phase traces at the same time, we only show one coherence trace and we only show one live IR trace. And you can tell the live IR and the coherence belong to whichever trace is on the top of the Z register. And we can use the Z key for stepping through that Z register. You can tell what traces are on the screen by clicking in the upper right hand corner of the plot. There's, that's our plot legend. And you'll see the different traces that are on the screen. And you can click on them to bring them to the front. Um, you can also see in the upper right hand corner the name of the trace that the name of the data that's on top. So in this case, um, the near field thing that I just captured is on top. You can also, another indicator that it's not the live measurement is the live measurement's color is green and you can see that the impulse response, the live IR, is purple like the captured data. Um, so when I bring, the, uh, when I bring the, the live data to the front, which is green, you can see that the live IR, which has blown up, is, is also green. Okay, well this, that's going to be important in a couple respects because if we're making changes in our system and we're going to be measuring continuously, if we're making changes but we're not seeing that change in the coherence, like you would expect the coherence to be dropping but it's not, or if uh, you would expect the live IR to be changing uh, and it's not, be sure that you're looking at a live trace and not a, a stored trace. That's often one of those places where you can confuse yourself. Again, look at the top of the, the top uh, name in the upper right hand corner that will tell you who's on top. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just simply going to go and change the, the gain through the system. So and so right there, what I just did was I turned the system down. Now how much did I turn it down? Well I can click on this trace right here and I can see on the screen, the divisions on the screen are in 3 dBs per, 
per line. You can go in and change that if you want a line every dB or every 6 dB, it's up to you. But the default is to have a, a line going by every 3 dB. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click on the data and I'm going to drag it up till it overlays the other data. And you can see that that took 6 dB worth of offset to get them to overlay each other. I can get rid of that offset by doing um, Y is the hotkey for dumping the Y register. Another place that that you can do that is if I look in th to the um, the plot legend, there's a button that says reset Y plus minus. So that that will also drop out that that um, offset. Now keep in mind, one of the things that one of the most important things that we're going to be doing with the magnitude trace is using it to compare levels of systems. In this case, I can see that that in one case, the system was 6 dB louder than it is currently. So now I've, I've turned this, the system down 6 dB. That's useful information. Um, when you start comparing traces, though, you need to make sure that if you're comparing them for level, that make sure you've gotten rid of all dB offsets you have on the screen. Otherwise, you might be thinking, wow, there's like a 32 dB level difference and I can just get rid of that offset. Just so make sure you flush out any trace offsets when you start comparing things. Another thing to point out here though is, so I'll go ahead and I'll put that, that level back. So one, two, three. So I, I move that back to that level. What I'm gonna do here is I'm going to go over to the preamps going into the microphone. So here I have control. These are the we're using a Yamaha Rio as the preamps for our microphone, and this microphone is coming down this channel right here. Watch what happens to our measurement when I vary the control of the preamp. So now I'm clipping the preamp and the data is being rejected. I'm going to take the level down of the preamp. And I'll turn that off for now. So this is this is actually a critical thing here is that what I was measuring when I was sitting in here I was sitting in here and I heard the system go up and down but I saw the trace stay in the same place right that's because the the gain of the system the sensitivity of the system wasn't changing I was just changing the level of the signals I was sending through it so reference and measurement went up and down together in the second case I could hear the system go up and down, but I actually saw it go up and down the screen because the gain change I was making was actually in our measurement loop. And so I was turning it up and down on the the uh, the amplifier, actually in the DSP, I was turning it up and down. And so that was in the measurement that we're, the system that we were measuring. And so I could see that. In the third case, what I was actually turning up and down was the preamps coming into smart and this is a critical this is this is kind of critical for us taking measurements one of the things we're going to want to do and i said this earlier on in i think sofo session one is um that we're going to want to take measurements and compare them to each other so in this case i want to take a measurement of the system then i want to change the gain or move the microphone and know the difference in the level well if i go and i change the input gains into smart between measurements, I've thrown off my reference, I've thrown out my ability to compare my two measurements for level. So keep in mind, if I'm going to take a series of measurements and I want to compare them for their position on the screen, their relative level, you need to not muck around with the input gains to your preamps between measurements. Don't sit back and re-optimize your gains coming into the preamps because you've thrown off your level references, you've thrown off your ability to compare your measurements. So in general, in your measurement process, as you're going, you're gonna go, say, place a microphone into the room, you may adjust your microphone level so it's at a good measurement level. Well, then when I move the microphone around, if I wanna 
be able to see the relative level at different microphone positions. I don't want to touch any of my input gains after that point. So I keep my, my gain structure the same throughout those measurements. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll come back over here. Um, okay, and so that was, that was our varying the level gain. And where, when we remember that your preamps are actually part of your measurement system. That's why we want preamps that are just neutral, neutral, flat, um, and be aware of when you're touching them and, and try and keep your hands off of them if you want to compare measurements. Okay, so the, here's a place I want to, I'm going to get rid of that, that uh, measurement in the background. I'm doing that. I'm just coming over um, in the, the data register. I'm just clicking on its icon to hide it. I could also open up the, uh, the plot legend and click on the icon to hide it right there. Either way, I hid that other data. Now this is, this is the part where I'm going to tell you, show you that smart is dumb. Okay, so we're going to take a measurement. And again, you got to do a little bit of listening here, but hopefully it will be very obvious. Um, so here's my measurement. I'm actively measuring. All right, so I I could certainly hear that. Um, hopefully you could hear that on, the, could you hear that on the, the, the pl oh, you guys are 30 seconds behind me, so he doesn't know if he could hear it on there. Okay, um, but yeah, it was pretty obvious that something was changing, and yet nothing was happening with my measurement. Why is that? Well, that's because the changes that I was making to the system were, the changes I was making were all upstream. They were on the mixer. They were part of the reference signal. If only we had a measurement that corresponded with our listening mechanism. Okay, well, what we're going to do is the phase trace here, um, we're not really using that measurement right now. We're not, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that plot and I'm going to switch them over to the RTA. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the microphone measurement and I'll drag him up a bit. And then we'll look at the output of the console. And we're going to look at that same measurement but now, see, the, the spectrum is the measurement that best corresponds with our hearing mechanism. Um, the transfer function measurement is just saying what happened between point A and point B. It's not telling you the entire story. So watch what happens when I go and, and start playing with the, the EQ on the, uh, the board. I oh, need to give noise here. So all it was showing me was that you could see the peak in the system. You could see that sweeping back and forth. You could see what frequencies that peak was at. Um, but what you were seeing was that it was faithfully being reproduced. The peak going in was shown and the peak coming out. So you didn't see any change in the measurement down below. If instead what I grabbed was the response, an EQ that was in the system. So I'll turn on the noise. Okay, and so there, what you could see was that as I was, as I was sweeping around the peak in the system, you could see it showing up on the output, but it wasn't on the input, right? So that peak was in the system that I was measuring. So again, you just seen it in the transfer function. Um, okay, so I'll refresh that. Okay, so um, <laughs> we just left the left my phone on. So somebody, maybe one of you guys, is calling me right now. Important safety tip, kids: make sure you've muted your phones for uh, when you're doing a demo. Okay, so um, I was just showing you that that basically 
what's going to show up in the what's going to show up in the magnitude response is going to be any changes that are within your measurement loop. So in the in the case of what we were looking at here, what was showing up was what was happening between the mix out and the microphone point. So when I played with the EQ in here, it showed up on measurement. When I played with EQ upstream, I could hear it. It'd show up in the spectrum of the output of the system, but it wouldn't show up in my transfer function measurement because the change didn't occur between reference signal and measurement signal. Okay, so I'm going to jump back over and do one more thing. I said, I said, hey, we can measure, um, we can measure with using music for our measurement signal. So instead of noise, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to switch over to a file. So I'm going to play music. So I'm going to hit V. I'm going to flush out the old data. And did the lights just blink? Yep. Hopefully that our power doesn't go off, but it said it was threatening to. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this same measurement, but I'm going to do it with music going through the system. So here we go. Okay, that's not music. That's uh, that's somebody reading a poem. Um, that is, but that's Patrick Stewart reading a poem. Okay, but you can see that it was getting the same measurement. All it's doing is comparing the signal that goes in, the signal that comes out. The problem was that the signal that I was using was more dynamic and it was much more sparse. He wasn't giving me all the frequencies there all the time. One of the things you also noticed was that when I started talking, um, you saw the coherence coming down in the mid-band here because I was corrupting the data. And there's not a lot, this measurement doesn't have a lot of data right now because it only had him talking at certain points. Um, but here's the thing, we can do a, a trick called the untuned radio. In this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to augment his voice and I'm going to actually mix in a little bit of noise in the background. So. Okay, so I'll turn off Patrick Stewart there. Um, so what was happening there is that what we had was a clever mix of, of Patrick Stewart there and Pink Noise. So we were mixing the, the, I was playing a file coming out of Smart, and then I have a Pink Noise stick uh, over here that was providing noise as well. So I mixed the two channels together. That's sort of a way um, to be able to have a broadband signal when music stops, you still have a little bit of noise in the background so you can keep measuring. Um, and so it's a, it's a way to have sort of the best of both worlds. Um, as far as Smart's concerned, it doesn't care what you feed it. It's just gonna say whatever shows up here, it's gonna look to see how faithfully it's being rep reproduced downstream. So if it's some clever mix of Patrick Stewart and Pink Noise, more power to you. Keep in mind that if I'm distorting the console, that's just part of my reference signal. And so we're, our measurement is just gonna be looking at how well that distortion is reproduced downstream. So it's always key to be able to know what's in your measurement loop and what's outside of your measurement loop. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take the microphone and we're gonna move the microphone back in the room. So uh, get an assistant to move the microphone to the position number two. Um, and so in, in this case, we just, move the, we just move the microphone back a bit. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn on the noise and it's not going to be Patrick Stewart anymore. I'll put it back to Pink Noise. Okay. So what happened? Well, what happened was we moved the microphone. Our delay isn't set properly anymore because we're, we're now about a meter back in the room. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to turn off, I'm going to turn on the noise again and I'm going to re-measure my delay. Now, one of the cool things about the find mechanism is it's going to tell us the difference between this delay, the current delay, which is 9.17 milliseconds, and our current measurement. So it's going to give us a nice little piece of information here. We call this the digitally implemented napkin, because if you take a delay measurement and then you take another one, 
Um, you'll often do this when you're setting delay times in systems. So you take the first arrival time, maybe that's your main system. Second arrival is the delay system. And on a mapkin with a crayon, you figure out the, the difference between the two. That's your delay difference. So here we go. And so what we see here is um, we see that the original, the measured delay is 12.81 milliseconds. It was before, it was 9.17, so the difference is 3.65 milliseconds, or about 1.25 meters. So we moved the, we had actually moved the microphone about 1.25 meters in space, and so that we see that difference change. So I'm gonna go ahead and insert that delay time, so we get back over here and we see my measurement again. Now a few things, a few things that I notice with our measurements is uh, one of them is it's lower in level. Well, I basically pretty much doubled the distance away from the speaker, and so I'm 6 dB down lower. Well, that's what I expect, 6 dB per doubling a distance. Second is that I notice that the coherence isn't as nice. We're starting to get reflections coming in causing problems. You can see that our trace isn't so smooth and nice. I would expect that. What's kind of interesting, if you can remember back to when I was doing that spinning spectrograph a bunch of episodes before, one of the things we noticed was this speaker lost its directivity down below 2K, 1K, and that's where we start seeing the coherence taking hits. We're getting more reflected energy down below that. It's just, I just think that's kind of interesting there. But basically what we see is we see um, that all the effects, we see a drop in level, we see a drop in coherence, what you would expect when you were moving back in the room. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce you to your new friend, your new best friend, um, that is the tracker. So the way we've been setting our delay times has been by hitting find and it you know it takes a little bit of time and comes up with a delay time. Instead, if I turn on the tracker and I can do that by hitting the button that says track there or this little dot up here. So with the tracker, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna click on the tracker and what the tracker is gonna do is it's gonna use the live IR to set the, the delay time for the delay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna move the microphone around and we're gonna watch this delay time. We're gonna watch this delay time here as we track that delay. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'll turn on the noise. Go ahead and move the microphone around. And you can see how it's just tracking, it's keeping that tracking. Okay, and we'll just set it down. Okay, now, rule number one of Tracker Club is, nobody talks about Tracker Club, but basically rule number one of the tracker is turn it off. Okay, because what happens here is the tracker is running non-stop right here and it's running with very short measurement uh, uh, time constants. And so um, it's running off the live IR and you, see, you notice how my measurement blew up when I turned the noise off. Well, that gave the tracker one last moment to kick my delay out of time. And so as soon as I turn on my noise, it locks down that time. And so the, the tracker is great. You can just, you can click it, you can nail that delay time um, very quickly. I'll show you that in just a second. Um, but as soon as you've got the delay time, if it's not gonna be changing, turn off the tracker. Um, there are other things that we're gonna be doing when we start looking at phase and reading timing and systems where we might purposely set our delay time for our measurement not on the, the peak of the impulse response, which is what the tracker is gonna do. It's gonna find that peak. Okay, so let's talk about the limitations of the tracker as well. One is that the tracker's time constant, and you can find that in transfer function options, and it's right down here, um, live impulse response, 8K or about 170 milliseconds, which means, remember we were talking about a third of a time constant with finding a delay? What that means is that the tracker is going to be good for finding the delay time as long as the time offset between reference and measurement is within 60, 70 milliseconds. So let's say I'm going to set my delay time to six, say 60 milliseconds. So, and I'll hide this, I'll hide this other data so you can see this happen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the noise and I'm going to click on my tracker and just see how quickly the tracker reels in my delay time. 
and it just snapped in didn't take uh, but you know half a second or whatever it just reeled in that delay time which is great the tracker I'm a type of person that likes to 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 move quickly in measurement and so the tracker is a quick way of of setting your delay time you move your microphone you turn the tracker on it grabs the new delay time turn the tracker off and then hit the V key. V is in Victor. That's a way of flushing out old data and getting the new data in and ready and measuring. So um, now here's where the tracker is going to fall down is let's say my delay time, let's say my delay is set wrong by 300 milliseconds. So the tracker has the actual delay time is somewhere around 12 milliseconds somewhere in there. Um, but my me my reference signal's delay is set to 300 milliseconds, so they're off from each other by almost 300 milliseconds. So the tracker, it's got a very small window, so it's not going to be able to find that delay time. And if you watch, I'll turn this on, it's going to just sit there and run all over the place. And it's just, it cannot find that delay time. It's jumping around, it can't find it, it can't find it, right? This is also true if you try doing this with um, if you try doing this with finding low frequency. It is particularly horrible about finding low frequency. That's because low frequency's energy is spread out over a much longer period of time, has a lower peak. It kind of gets buried in the noise floor. And so, any of you who have tried to use the tracker for finding subs, it's not going to work. Um, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that in a later. Uh, when we start talking about impulse response and looking at impulse responses and things like that. But right now, the tracker, good for finding the high frequency in the system. And remember that you want that delay offset to be within about 60 milliseconds. Otherwise, hitting find, find, find is going to be good for finding uh, offsets upwards of, of uh, hundreds of milliseconds off from each other. Um, so it's got about a 1.6 second time constant, so it's good for finding delay times up of 600 milliseconds, which is a pretty large uh, window there. Okay, um, so what I'm going to show you now is I'll, I'll kick, I'm going to take its delay time, I'm just going to guess it's 34 milliseconds. I just know that's in the ballpark, so then quickly I turn this on, I turn on the tracker. And I've got that delay time nailed down. Okay, so what I'm about to do is um, we've got a little bit of time, but we got to take some measurements. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to I'm going to uh, we're going to have the microphone move. So can you move the microphone to the first measurement position? So we're gonna we're gonna do a series of measurements. So we're gonna we're gonna look at just three measurement positions in the back in the listening area of the speaker back in the room. And so the whole process goes like this. I'm going to I'm going to turn on the noise. I'm going to get my delay time. Once that's set, I'm going to hit V. I'm going to hit V as in Victor. Now the the thing here is that I'm also going to take my averager and I'm going to increase my averaging. Increasing my averaging is going to help uh, increase signal to noise in my measurement and stabilize my measurement. It's going to improve the data. Now the the thing is. Um, sometimes I'll be taking measurements and changing the system. Well, here's a way what you can do is you can increase your averager three seconds, five seconds. But if you're making changes, use the V key, which flushes out the averager. And, and so if you, if you make a change, just hit V and get the response. So it's kind of best of both worlds there, where I get the responsiveness of hitting the V, but I've got the, the, the stability of a longer average. The other thing that we want to be aware of is here, particularly in the low end, which is where the noise is here, and you'll see it in the coherence trace, is don't just capture the data right away. What we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to set our delay time, we're going to flush out the old data, we're going to, and then we're going to give our data a little bit of time to settle so that I know that I've got good data and I'm going to see the, the bottom end of my measurement particularly take some time to stabilize. Once that's stable, I'm going to capture that data. I'm going to call it P1. Um, once I've done that, I'm going to give a thumbs up to our assistant and uh, she's going to go and she's going to move to the second measurement position. I'm then going to set my delay again. I'm going to uh, flush out the old data. I'm going to capture one once it's stable, call that P2. Then we'll move it to the third position and we'll call that P3. So that's what we're about to do. So I'm going to go ahead, I'll turn on the noise. 
and set my delay time, hit the V key, So we'll move to the second position and I'll leave the tracker on. You'll notice that as she's moving the microphone to the second position, it's tracking. Now the microphone is there, I hit V, flush out the old data. There we go. I just I just captured three pieces of data here. Um, what I'm going to do what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to look at the the magnitude trace for right now. We'll talk about the phase trace later. Um, but um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off my live measurement. I'm just going to look at the stored data. Um, so now I've I've got three traces. You can see if I drop down the my uh, plot legend, you can see I've got P1, I've got P2, I've got P3. Each one of these pieces of data, I want to verify that I set my delay right. Well, so here's, here's uh, P1 or P3. You notice that the impulse is in the center and you see the coherence is decent up at the top. Not as perfect as near field, but still uh, decently high. Same thing with P2, the impulse in the center and the, the, uh, the coherence is decently high. Here's P1, last. So each one of those measurements was good. Before I can start making decisions on data, I have to verify that the data is good. And one of the critical parts of doing a transfer function measurement is making sure that you set your delay properly. So what I'm going to do here now is I'm going to go um, into uh, view number five. View number five is magnitude over magnitude. And I'm going to take these traces, I'm going to drag them up, I want to compare these traces to each other, so I want to compare their general shape. So I'm, I'm just grabbing this data and overlaying them. Now here's a, a quick trick that's really cool. So if, let's say this data is all over the place. If I look at my, if I look at my uh, plot legend, you can see my offsets for each of those pieces of data. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hold down shift and click on the plot. I'm going to left click on the plot and it sets everybody to the same level at that where I clicked it. So the whole point here is I'm doing sort of an eyeball averaging of my data. So what I've got here is I've got all three of those measurements and I'm just looking for a trend. Well notice that in this data the reason why I do this dem demonstration is for for two reasons really. The first reason why I do this demonstration is to just show you how quickly the measurements go. You just place your microphone, get your delay time, flush the old data, let your averager do its work, capture it. So we captured um, high resolution data really pretty quickly. Um, the second thing is the, the don't jump or don't panic. You notice that as we move around in space and there, it's probably the microphone positions are probably about, it looks like a meter and a half apart from each other. Um, and you can see that there's peaks and dips and, and stuff, but oftentimes the peaks in one place are, are dips in other places. There's a peak, but there's a, there's a peak there, but the peak in the, and hopefully one of the things that's gonna start to inform you here is that that reverberant structure, those, that peaks and dips, those high Q, when I say high Q, I mean narrow, either narrow in coverage or, or narrow in frequency, like with a, a narrow filter. But basically we see these peaks and dips where you might have a high Q peak here that's in a different place at a different measurement position. All of these are valid measurement positions. Um, we're going to spend more time on this later on, but in this case, what we've got here is I've got three different opinions in the main listening area of the speaker, and hopefully it kind of starts to tell you maybe I shouldn't just blindly go after um, one of these traces and if I, if I hide the other two traces here, you'll notice that if I went after this guy and this guy and this guy, as soon as I 
bring in this trace, all of a sudden this guy's peak is in a different position. And, um, so really what we're looking to do is we're looking to see the canopy of the forest and not get caught up in uh, in going after individual trees, but look at the shape of the, the forest. Now, a tool that we have for kind of doing this is a spatial average, or we just average multiple traces together. And so I'll go ahead and do that. I can do that in my menu here, um, in my data bar menu. There's a little drop down here. I'm gonna come halfway down, it says average. Now, there's a few different ways of triggering this. We'll, we'll touch on this again um, in later episodes. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click the data that I want to average together. So I'm staying away from our near field guy. I'm just going for these. Um, I'm also going to click the, the color. I'm going to set this color so it really stands out. So I'm going to, I'm going to make him sort of this whitish blue. I'm going to hit apply. Um, and so we're going to, we'll talk about these variables as well as we come up. We're doing a coherence, average, coherence weighted DB average. So it, what it's doing is for each trace, it's taking into account the coherence value at, at different frequencies. So if one trace has a higher coherence value at a frequency than others, it gets more weight in the average. So it's a way of kind of biasing our data to more, to better data. So I'll go ahead and hit OK. And what we see here is the average of it. And you notice that by averaging them together, it starts to produce, in general, the, the, the envelope of those measurements right there. So if your eye was looking at the envelope of all these traces right here, the average, the mathematical average between these guys is a good indicator of it. You notice that the ripple in the trace is a lot less severe. Well, that's what we're doing. We're averaging these traces together to suppress the variance, which is the position dependent ripple. And so it's just giving us a good idea of what's going on there. So whether you go with a with a spatial average or whether you just do an eyeball average, or here, I'll take this trace, I'm gonna hit the M key and I'm gonna move him down. And I'll just pick one of these traces. Say I'll pick the green trace up top. So I'm gonna, if I wanna move the green trace down, I wanna make sure he's on top up here. So I go ahead and I'll click on him and I'll hit M as in move. And so the question is, can you look at the green trace but see the average trace? And I think the answer is obviously yes. And that's, you know, one of the keys if you have to move quickly is being able to see the trend and not get caught up in the little peaks and dips. Um, and so um, that's one of the skills you need to develop when you're using data like this is not get caught up in diving into holes, that's pretty scary, or going after sharp peaks, but be looking at the general trend. The thing that I find is interesting here is if I move him up, um, I'm gonna also show our, our near field uh, measurement, I'll drag him down to here. So what I did is I just dragged the trace down in here. But what I find is really interesting here is that the once I average these traces together, it is pretty amazing that in the top end, the average of those three, the three measurements we did and the near field measurement agree almost spot on to each other. Now we see a little bit of variance down low, but that's of course what we're looking for is there we've got some loading, extra low frequency energy banging around if I was to apply some equalization, that would probably be about the only thing I would be going after is what's going on it just to decrease the effect of that low frequency. Now, you know, you're if you really want to get rid of that energy in the room, you should, you know, change the treatment of the room or get a speaker that has better directivity down there. But in this case, that's the kind of stuff you're looking for. You notice that this is a this is the average is showing me that this is that speaker in the near field just projected out into more of the far field. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put that trace away. I just find that to be interesting. Okay, so got a couple of quick demos for you to finish this off. Um, one of these demos, it, what we're going to do is this. I'm going to take and hide this data that I just created. One, two, three. But I'll, I'll leave this guy down here. Actually, I'll, I'll hide him for a second. We'll, we'll come back and get that data. So what I'm gonna do is I've put three microphones out in the room. So I created a, 
a multi-mic setup. So I've got a microphone at three different places in the room. If we look at the measurement configuration, I can get there by Alt-G or hitting this little hammer and wrench icon. Um, and so pop up don't. So what, what we'll see is that I've added a mic two and a mic three. So transfer function one is mic one compared to mix out. Mic two is mic two compared to mix out, mic three. So it's just three transfer functions like the one we just did. We're just gonna do them simultaneously. And then I've got the average, the mic average. And so that, when we're adding traces, when we're adding measurement engines, there's four types of measurement engines. There's a transfer function measurement engine and a, a live spectrum measurement transfer function engine. This is a single channel measurement engine. This is a dual channel cha measurement engine. And then we have live averages of each. The live average engine actually gets its input, actually gets its input from, oh, come on. It actually gets its input from the output of the other measurements. So it's not averaging the microphones together and then comparing them to the reference. What it's doing is it's doing three transfer functions and then averaging those actively together. So we're doing the exact same thing we did statically, but we're doing this live. Um, which is which I'm just going to do very quickly what we're going to do and we'll use this technique um, in later uh, sessions as well so uh, we'll, we'll get deeper into it when we get into um, so looking at uh, microphone placement and spatial averaging and stuff like that um, but what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and turn on the noise turn on the first measurement second measurement third measurement Turn on the tracking, 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 right? And say uh, no tracking. I'll go to this guy and I'll push him up a little bit. And so what we have here now is my three transfer functions. It looks a lot like the, the data I just had. So I'm going to go to the number five view. So magnitude trace or magnitude trace. And I'm going to turn on the live average. So here is my live average. This is an active, an active measurement of the system. So that you'll see, I'm going to take this trace and I'm going to move him down to a lower window. But you're going to see that if I change this system, you will actively see that change in the system. So I've got sort of a peak at 1K here. So if I come over here and do this, the B. And so you can see as I was changing the system, you could actively see that show up. Now with this measurement, if I come over here and I turn on my live average, that I had before, I'll take him and I'll move him down. This, so this was my, this was my other average. They're basically the same measurements because it, instead of taking um, the measurements serially, measure, move, measure, move, measure, move, we're just measuring them all simultaneously. Um, and so here we're using smart, the power of smart, where I can set up instead of just one measurement, I can actually measure multiple simultaneous measurements. Okay, now there's one other example I want to do and we'll get on to questions and we will definitely get back to this. This is not the last time we're going to be, we're going to be dealing with this. So I'm kind of running through this, uh, kind of running it through quickly. We haven't even touched smoothing yet. We're going to, we're going to, when we get into doing data reading and, and things like that, we'll get back into things like the smoothing. Um, but um, what I'm going to what I'm going to do here is one more uh, measurement, and we're going to use multi engines to do that as well. And so I'm going to jump back over, and we call this room EQ resultant. And so um, we did the multi mic, we did the live averaging. So room EQ resultant. This is a situation. This is this is actually one of the first ways I learned to do this measurement because this is this was kind of hard coded into the SIM measurement process. The SIM analyzer, source independent measurement analyzer by Meyer Sound, um, is a dual channel measurement analyzer. Um, 
I started using this back when the the EQs were analog parametric EQs, and so um, we were actively measuring the the EQ at the same time we were measuring our system. So the way this goes is I've got a system. I've got one measurement is going to be a measurement of the EQ or the DSP here, and so. It, with this guy, we're using a reference signal is going to be the mix out. The measurement signal is going to be the DSP out. So that signal that I have coming in, I think was coming in on channel six or seven. I forget which one, but we'll see it. So I'm comparing. So for the, the room measurement, I compare from the EQ out to the microphone. So I'm getting a response to this system. So the EQ, the DSP is not in that measurement loop. So if I change the EQ, I'll see it in this measurement, but I won't see it in this measurement. And then the result measurement measures from the mix out to the microphone. So it gives me the basic idea here is that I have a room and speaker response that I'm using an EQ to adapt that response. And so I can see the EQ's response, the room and speaker's response, and then the result of the two. And so those are the three measurements that I'm going to be doing simultaneously. So if we jump back over here in Smart, I have a branch set up. I feel like one of those those cooks on a show where it's like, okay, we'll mix this up and we'll put it in the oven. And I did this. Perfect. It's. I'll get better at this too. I swear. Um, so the the actual um, the actual setup of this uh, this tab, you'll notice that I have the room measurement in green. It's going to be from the DSP out to the mic channel. The um, the EQ measurement is going to be from the mix out to the DSP out. We just looked at that on the on that graphic. And then the last guy is going to be result. So he's the mix out to the mic out. So this measurement is the combination of this system with that system. Okay, one other thing here is that the with the EQ, the EQ measurement itself is going to be um, it's going to be a uh, digital measurement, I don't need a lot of averaging. So what I'm going to do, remember how we did this with, with the Spectrum engines, but I'm going to go for this engine, I'm going to say, you know what, I don't want a lot of averaging, your low noise environment, but I want you to be really responsive. So I'm going to make him 8 FIFO instead of 3 seconds. So it's just saying follow your own averager. The, the measurements, the acoustic measurements with the microphone, we're going to do a bunch of averaging because we want to get a, a more accurate measurement, suppress noise and all that. So what I'm also, what I'm going to do is I'll get out of there. I've got one more trick up my sleeve coming up. But what we're going to see here is with our, with our, in our transfer function, I'm going to go ahead and turn on the noise again. So here's my room measurement. Here is my EQ measurement. And then this is the result measurement. I'll take these lines and bring them up. So I'm going to turn off the noise for just a second. And so I'm going to get rid of the, the phase trace here. So again, I'm going to a, a different view. It's, we're not getting rid of the data. I'm just not showing it on the screen because I want to use that, that real estate to do a view like this. So what, what we have here is we have the EQ and the room up top and then the result down low. So we'll see what I'm doing with my EQ. We'll see what, what the system is doing. So this is the system without the EQ in it. And then we're going to see the result of it. So I'm going to be using my EQ to change the response of the system. Um, and so one of the things that we're going to do here, see, I, I failed. I left, the, I left the tracker on. So hold on just a second. So what I think is interesting here is when you look at the delay times, the EQ has 3.12 milliseconds, so that's where we had that extra latency was in the DSP. Then we have um, the room, the system from the output of the EQ to the microphone is 13.42, and then the result is the sum of the latency of those two systems. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and turn on the noise, and I'm going to apply some EQ. So. So 
So here's the thing. It is, I'm trying to set up my EQ. This is what's known as complementary equalization. So I'm trying to set my EQ to be uh, the complement to the response of the system. So where the system has excess energy, it's got buildup, I'm putting a cut to de-emphasize that. Well, it's easier to make traces look the same than different. And so uh, here's my little trick. I'm going to double click on the measurement engine. And in the definition of the engine, I'm just going to come over here and there's a little checkbox that says invert the, the magnitude display of the EQ. So now where it shows a peak here, it's actually a cut. And so then I can, I can more easily match my EQ to the complement of the response of the system. Now, the temptation is to play this like a video game because it's kind of cool. I'm, I'm laying out my EQ, I'm squashing the bumps in the system. We're going to address that later, but generally um, you, you don't want to just be sitting there with your EQ trace trying to get that line maximally flat. So we'll go, we'll go into this at a later time. I'm going to come back over here and just make sure I have a good measurement and hit pause on it. I'm going to hit capture all. When I hit capture all, what capture all did was capture all three live measurements and it's going to make a little folder up here. I'm going to call this RER1. So I hit OK. And what it's done is it's captured all three measurements simultaneously that we were just doing. So here what we've got is, is um, I'm doing three simultaneous transfer functions. One's, one is set to a, a digital device. The other two are the acoustic response. So we'll get out of here. Hopefully that all made sense. Hopefully you get a chance to, to set up a system like this and then uh, and do these same measurements at home. One of the things to pay attention to is what's in your measurement loop and what's not in your measurement loop. Because even though you'll hear some things, it doesn't mean that it's happening in in the system that you're measuring. I'm working for a mix engineer. I'm a I'm a horrible mix engineer. I'm I'm good at sitting next to the mix engineer. So the mix engineer looks at me and says, "I'm getting way too much sibilance in the system." I look at my measurements and I say, "Well, it's not the system. How do I know that?" Well, because I'm starting my measurement from the output of the console and I'm looking at the response of the system downstream of the console and I see my system measurement having a very, you know, controlled, you know, high frequency response. It doesn't mean that there isn't high frequency that's causing a problem. It just means that it's in the source signal, fix it at the source. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Um, Michael, what do we got? Did we have anybody show up for this? Uh, yes, we had more than six people show up, oh, okay. and uh, we had a, uh, a a couple of really good questions. Um, one thing I wanted you to just touch on, if you can, is the idea that if you touch your preamp gain during your measurement process, um, now we can't make relative level statements. So can you talk about, at the beginning of your workflow, how you're setting your preamp gains? Well, okay, so the I'll give you the I'll give you the whole course right here, at least the transfer function part, which is get your signal going in, get your signal coming out, set their set their levels. Now when I say set their levels is you need a good you want a good signal level. So if you're looking at your input meter um, on smart, you'll see those input meters down there. They're um, if they show up on that meter that on the transfer function, they're at least uh, that's a thick negative 40 dB from full scale. Um, the meter turns yellow right about minus 12. So at minus 12 um, generally, if you're using pink noise for a measurement, that's a good place to have your signal level for doing measurements, but you can get decent measurements with the, the signal levels being lower than that. But one of the, one of the things is that if I, if I go and move my microphone, like I move my microphone while I'm measuring in the near field, I'm generally going to turn down the sensitivity of my microphone because it's 
much louder, it can be like 20 dB louder, 18 dB louder, one meter from the speaker than the what it's going to be back in the room, just because of doubling distances. So I'll turn down the sensitivity of the microphone. So as soon as I move my microphone back into the room, I'll probably readjust the gain of the microphone to to account for that 18 dB of drop. Now, if the you always got to be aware of the question you're asking. If the question that you're asking is, what's the level difference between one meter in front of the speaker and and 18 meters away from the speaker or something like that, then you don't want to change your your input gain to your microphone. But generally, um, you're moving your microphone out there. You're going to readjust the the gain level for the microphone that's more appropriate to you know, being back in the room. However, from that point, when I go to move my microphone around, I am actually curious about the level difference throughout the listening area. So I want to make sure that once I've got the my input gain set with that initial measurement position, I don't muck with them. And so then it's you get the signal going in, signal coming out, find the delay offset, average. Let your averager do its work. Um, so what we saw with our three measurements here was that we went back out. I didn't feel it was necessary to change my, my gain structure on my, my mics. And so we just left them where they are. We moved them. We set the microphone down, found the delay, let flushed out the old data, let the averager do its work, moved the microphone. You just want to set yourself up so that you don't reach over and readjust your input gains on your preamps um, measurement to measurement to measurement. Now this is this is straight up because Smart has no idea what your input gains are on your device. It is our full intention and you can see with some devices like we can talk to an OctaCapture, we can start monitoring the gains on the devices. So in the future where road, roads are paved in cheese and, and we all have communicators right up here. Um, we hope to be able to monitor the gain through your system so that as you go and you muck with your input gains on your preamps, Smart knows that you changed it and so it can adjust for that. But right now it's blind to your preamps and so it doesn't know that you've changed your gains. Um, so if you want to compare measurements for relative level, you, you need to be responsible for not changing your gain in between measurements. Does that make sense? Does that I yeah, keep, I look. I he's over here on the screen. I, I should look you straight in the eye. I think so. And the, uh, a couple of questions when you start talking about coherence, um, you know, how it's not really a pass fail as much as more context. Can you talk about what constitutes a good coherence versus a bad coherence? Okay. So when we're looking at uh, th this measurement that we have right on the screen, is there is a good a good idea here. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to go. I'm going to generate the noise. I'm going to generate the noise and I'm going to unmute this and I'm going to take this measurement down here so I was expecting the coherence to change see this is a teachable moment I was expecting the coherence to change but actually What's on the top of the screen is a stored measurement. So I'm going to hide these, these captured measurements. So you can see. OK, so in our measurement coming up here, what we see is this. We see um, that the coherence down low, it's, that's a systemic failure. It's, that it's something wrong. It's just that the system's not reproducing down there. So we're sending signal in, but we're not getting anything back. OK, that's fine. We know that the, the system is not actually producing much energy below about 40 cycles. Um, we, as we go along, if I start talking, so I'll, I'll corrupt my measurement. Hey, I'm talking, and I'm talking, and I'm talking, and I'm talking. We're walking, we're walking. So when I was talking, you saw that the coherence was coming down. It, was, it wasn't stable. It wasn't locked in. Um, that's a good indicator of noise in the environment causing a drop in coherence. So it's not settling down. Um, and if I had turned up the level I was measuring at and the coherence got better, that would tell me I'm overcoming noise in the environment. The, keep in mind, 
pink noise is the mating call of the vacuum cleaner. So as soon as you're in a space and you turn on the pink noise, what happens? Well, the people working in the room go, oh, they're making noise, I can make noise. So they, it's, you know, it's, it, it's not, um, what do you call it? it was, uh, there's not malintended. I mean, people just say, okay, you're making noise, I can make noise. If somebody was running a radial arm saw on, uh, radial arm saw, radial arm saw, see, we're getting near the end of this, this uh, session. Um, somebody's running a saw on stage, um, yeah, of course you can run a vacuum cleaner around the hall. Nobody's being bothered. So they don't know that the noise that you're running through the system is actually a, a, a signal and not just, you know, letting the DBs out of the system. And so that people will start running the vacuum cleaner. And the weirdest thing is you'll be sitting there and all your coherence is starting to come unstable in the mid band because they're off vacuuming in the back of the room by where your microphone is placed. Um, but you'll see the coherence is not going to stabilize and then you'll turn off your noise for a second and you see the the noise continues onwards and so a lot of people out there listening have been in that movie before but basically what i'm saying is in the coherence so at the bottom end of the coherence that coherence is is collapsed all the way to the bottom that's just the system isn't responding down there i'm not getting good data the system's not responding in the mid band we had some contamination due to noise. I could turn up the level that I was I was sending through the system, and if the coherence got better, it meant that I was overcoming noise. Um, there's going to be a point though where I turn up the level and the coherence doesn't get any better, and then we're dealing with we're dealing with direct reverberant. We're dealing with reflections. Now, when you see the coherence kind of having stalact looking like stalactites that's a good indication that it's reverberant reflected energy that is coming back and so um that's sort of the blood on the screen the thing is the changing your measurement level is not going to change that you can't change direct reverb ratio by turning up the system um so what we're going to notice is as i bring my microphone closer to the speaker that should get better we noticed that i may i pointed this out earlier was that we saw with the coherence here, we saw that that it kept good high coherence up top where the horn in the speaker is giving me good direct reverberant. But as we get down into the lower drivers that have uh, less pattern control, we end up seeing more of these stalactites coming in. This is not this isn't saying that I have bad data. This is bad data down here. This is saying I have a good measurement of an acoustically active room. You go to uh, a, a concert hall or something like that, those rooms are built for reverberance. Um, and they're built to reflect energy back in and, and, and all that. Now, if you're looking to, to get a highly intelligent environment, all those reflections are gonna come back to haunt you. So it's gonna, it's gonna give you a sort of an indication of, of transmission quality. Um, and then, of course, the last thing, the reason why in the lower measurement down here I set the delay wrong is here it's saying that I'm an idiot. I haven't set my delay properly, and so that stair step, step shape um, is a good indicator that I haven't set my measurement delay. So if I come back in and set my measurement delay... Once my delay was set properly, you can see that the coherence is up. And so all of these all these elements are sort of intermingling. This is why it becomes a real issue. When you want to try and use SMART to measure harmonic distortion in a system, the problem is that its impact on your coherence trace is really tiny unless the harmonic distortion is insane, like 40%, 20%. Um, so the thing is, the thing is that noise and reflections, late arriving reflections, are going to have much more of an impact on your your coherence trace. Um, so that, but that's kind of reading the coherence trace. The good thing is that that wingman is with you all the time. You don't you don't want to hide your coherence trace. I hate the fact that the C button is the hotkey for hiding the coherence trace. I just that. That I, I have a joke in class. It's a geek joke. All my jokes are geek jokes. But it was basically you come up to somebody and they've they've got their coherence hidden. They say, "Why are you hiding your coherence?" And they say, "Well, it's getting in the way of my measurement." It's like, 
it's trying to tell you something, right? It's, it's like going to the, the, your auto mechanic and having them put a louder radio in your car because your engine is making horrible noises, right? Is that, that, that coherence is telling you different things. It's telling you the system isn't responding down there. That's fine to get a subwoofer, right? Um, here we're getting some reflections. We get less up as we go up because we're getting better directivity, um, but I have my delay set. Did that work? Make sense? Yeah, I think so. I think that's great. Uh, and I just want to mention there's a lot of folks in the chat with application specific questions. And for <laughs> that, we encourage you to reach out to support at rationalacoustics.com and you can chat with our instructors about those things. And so the, my, the full intention, the way that this is designed today was more about the, the mechanics of how that what's what influences my measurement what doesn't influence my measurement, what's in my measurement loop, what's not in my measurement loop. Um, the first thing is, the reason why that's really important is, you are responsible for troubleshooting your measurement, right? You're the one that's looking at your measurement. Before you can go and make good decisions, you have to verify that you have a good measurement. So what we're starting with is just the mechanics of the measurement, right? What we'll get into once we get past, we'll, we'll do reading the phase trace, and then we'll come back around and we'll actually start using this tool for making some basic decisions. And we'll talk about relift, response level polarity timing. As a system engineer, those are the pieces of information that I need is relift, response level polarity timing, right? So there we go. I did, I, I, I actually touched the controls. Um, but the, those piece, those elements we'll talk about okay so where do we put our microphone where do we place our microphone although for the the operator fundamentals course this is about the mechanics of how this thing operates and how to control it and how to how to go from a view with a phase trace over a magnitude trace to a magnitude trace over a magnitude trace or can i put a, a a spectrum trace above a magnitude trace or below a magnitude trace it's about controlling my measurement how to change my averager and all that that's what this this course is about um, the whole idea is getting everyone comfortable so that you know, we have 25 instructors uh, worldwide that teach some great courses out there so we can all get into actual application classes that are, are more the fun that we want to we want to do with this but first we need to know how to use this tool then we'll we'll start to we'll start to apply it to making decisions so Fantastic. We, I think that's, uh, that's probably about it for today. So thanks everyone for joining us and Thank you uh, stay very safe much. out there. And hopefully our power is still at home when I get home. We'll All right, guys. Out. Be safe.